Well, good evening, everyone. And on behalf of Bishop Susan, the Diocese of Niagara, and uh, Bishop Lindsay uh, Irwin, Superior of the Oratory of the Good Shepherd, a very warm welcome to Christ Church Cathedral this evening, to those who are with us in person, and to those who are joining us online. It's a delight to have you with us. Uh, we feel both honored and privileged to be hosting the Oratory of the Good Shepherd service of Coral Evensong. Their general chapter is currently meeting at Mount Carmel, Niagara Falls, and they're joined together this evening by members of other religious communities here in Ontario. We welcome them all. I would want on your behalf to thank very much our religious communities for their faithfulness. In many ways, they are the lifeblood of the corporate church. Their health and well-being is our health and well-being. So we pray together especially that the Artry's time at Mount Carmel will be a time of deep refreshment and renewal for them. Now, one of the, God's great gifts to the Artry during their general chapter and to us this evening is that their retreat leader is none other than the Right Reverend and Right Honourable Dr. Ron Williams, Bishop, uh, sorry, Baron Williams of Oystermouth and former Archbishop of Canterbury. Bishop Rowan is our preacher this evening. He's going to be exploring with us what the radical newness of Christian identity reveals and makes possible. I struggle to think of anyone better formed and better qualified to speak to us about what it means to be renewed through life in Christ. I know we'll be in for a treat this evening. In the course of this liturgy, we continue to give thanks, of course, for the remarkable life and witness of Her Late Majesty the Queen, and we pray for the King and the Royal Family in their grief during this time of national mourning. There will be a reception at the rear of the church following the service. We'd love to meet with you over refreshments if you have time to stay. Now, for those who wish, I invite you now to join with me in the territorial acknowledgement which you'll find printed on page four in your service bulletin. We acknowledge that we gather today on the lands occupied by the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe nations at the time of the creation of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. We honor and respect these nations and commit ourselves to walk together gently upon this land. I invite you now please to stand for our processional hymn.
Dearly beloved, the scripture moveth us in sundry places to acknowledge and confess our manifold sins and wickedness, and that we should not dissemble nor cloak them before the face of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, but confess them with an humble, lowly, penitent, and obedient heart, to the end that we may obtain forgiveness of the same by his infinite goodness and mercy. And although we ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our own sins before God, yet ought we most chiefly so to do when we assemble and meet together to render thanks for the great benefits that we have received at his hands, to set forth his most worthy praise, to hear his most holy word, and to ask those things which are requisite and necessary as well for the body as the soul. Wherefore, I pray and beseech you as many as are here present to accompany me with a pure heart and humble voice unto the throne of the heavenly grace. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou them that are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto humankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desireth not the death of a sinner, but rather that they may turn from their wickedness and live, hath given power and commandment to his ministers to declare and pronounce to his people, being penitent, the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardoneth and absolveth all them that truly repent and unfeignedly believe his holy gospel. Wherefore, we beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that those things may please him which we do at this present, and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy, so that at the last we may come to his eternal joy. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. O Lord, open thou our lips. And
Here beginneth the first verse of the 37th chapter of the book of Ezekiel. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all round them. They were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded. And as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves. O oh, my people, I will put my spirit within you and you shall live. And I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. The word of the Lord.
The second reading is from the Gospel according to Matthew, the 10th chapter beginning at the first verse. Then Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Simon, the Canaanian, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of God has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for laborers deserve their food. Whatever town or village you enter, find out who in it is worthy and stay there until you leave. As you enter the house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But, it if it's, but if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only 
who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you.
light and our darkness, we beseech thee, O Lord, and by thy great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of thy only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May I just say, first of all, how very grateful I am to be invited to join you this evening. What a privilege it is to be here with the Oratory and with all of you. We meet, as I don't need to remind you, in unusual times, nationally and internationally. And back home in the United Kingdom, there is a lot of talk about the sense of brokenness or fracture that comes with a moment of loss, a moment of public crisis. With the death of the Queen, we ask ourselves, how do we hold together as a society, as a nation? Doubtless we'll manage. But it's a time when, of course, we do think about the experience of brokenness and of fracture, an experience not unknown in the Christian church, and they tell me not entirely unknown in the Anglican communion either. <laughs> but it goes deeper than that. If we look at our first reading this evening, it's not just about social fracture. It's not just that the people of Israel to whom Ezekiel is addressing his words are not getting on very well with one another. Each one of them 
is broken. Each person is reduced to bits and pieces. What is going to bring them not only alive, but bring them together as persons? And that perhaps is one of the deepest questions we can ask ourselves as spiritual beings. What holds us together as persons? And the answer to that question is deeply bound up with what holds us together with one another. Because you see, the bad news is that if we can't hold ourselves together, we shall always be looking at one another with fear and suspicion. Or we should be looking at one another with overinvestment in the other person's capacity to bring me together again. I dread the other, or I expect too much of the other. And unless somehow I can see a way of being brought together as a person, my hopes for getting on with my neighbor are a bit slender. One of the things that the life of religious communities gives to the wider church as a gift is the taking of a really extraordinary risk. The person taking religious vows says, the promise I make to God and the promise God makes to me, these will be what hold me together. Nothing more, nothing less. I don't expect to be held together by having a nice successful career of a conventional kind. I don't expect to be held together by playing my part in society and bringing up an exemplary family. What holds me and unites me as a person is promise. My promise to God, God's promise to me. And to live together in a community of people who have staked their lives on this. Well, those sitting in the front rows will know just how risky and how eccentric that is and how hard it can be. And yet, that is a reminder to the rest of us in the body of Christ of how we all have to learn not to put ourselves together with ingenuity and success, but to wait for a love we can't understand or fathom to put us together. A great Roman Catholic writer of the last century was remembered by one of his friends as being told on one occasion, pull yourself together, and replying, I haven't got it together. And for all of us, something of that is true. We haven't got it together. We haven't got a ready-made answer to the question of who am I? How do I string the different bits of my life together? We all look back on our memories with pretty mixed emotions. That worked, that didn't, that connected, that fractured. That seemed to be a step forward, that seemed to be a step sideways, and let's not talk about the steps backwards. Is the self I was then the self I am now? And was that self truer or larger than what I am now, or the other way around? Who knows? And yet, in Ezekiel's vision, surrounding all these bits and pieces that lie fractured in the desert, Surrounding all this are the four winds to which the prophet addresses his summons. Come from the four winds, O breath. Breathe life into these bones. The four winds, everywhere we look, the Spirit of God, swirling around us, blowing us together into a connection we couldn't have imagined for ourselves or achieved for ourselves. 
and that radical offering that religious make, I'm just going to be held together by the Spirit of God. That is a word and a sign for the rest of us. We're all thinking about Her Late Majesty and one saying of hers that was quoted more than once last weekend was, I have to be seen to be believed. She was visible on great events, visible to her people, because that's what monarchy was about. She was there, and she needed to be visibly there. And in the church, we do need a few people around who are visibly there, visibly living out that confidence that the promise of God will hold us together. That however fragmented, unsuccessful, bitty and frustrating our lives may look, something is blowing from the four corners of the globe, the Spirit of God, whose purpose is to make us at one with ourselves and at one with one another, inseparably. The Spirit who heals and absolves each one of us, addressing our own unique wounds, our own unique failures, and also addressing our alienation from one another. And in so doing, of course, healing our alienation from God also. That blows in upon us, the gale that sweeps across the desert of dry bones. That's God's purpose for all of us. And for us to believe that, we need to see it. And for us to see it, we need to see it in certain styles of life. Not that, with due respect to those sitting in the front row, religious are always exemplary exponents of integrated, peaceful, grace-filled lives. It's just that the promises they've made say to the church and the world Peace-filled lives are not a fantasy, and we will stake today and tomorrow and the day after on our confidence that they're not a fantasy, and our trust that the God who surrounds us has the capacity to bring us together and hold us together, to make us one with ourselves and one with one another in all kinds of ways we couldn't devise and couldn't imagine. And when we turn to what Jesus says to his apostles in the gospel reading for this evening, we see just a little bit of what it means when the Spirit has blown those bones together and clothed them with flesh and stood them upright. What then do those living, breathing beings do in their renewal? They go out, they speak words of promise, they heal, they push back against the occupation of the world by the forces of division, by the diabolical. They speak words of peace. And I'm sure that you, like myself, have often been struck by the bluntness of what Jesus says towards the end of that discourse. If you speak words of peace and peaceful people are listening, it'll land. And if you speak peace and it's not received, let your peace return to you. Let it bounce back. In other words, don't let your apparent failure break you. Don't let it make you cynical or despairing. Stay at peace. Hold to the promise, stand your ground, let your peace return to you. Because your success at sharing the word, your success in convincing or compelling the world towards faith is actually neither here nor there. It's nice to be successful. It's nice to know what you're doing. It's nice to know what the future might look like. And here we are, 
In the 21st century, with traditional forms of religious life under immense strain, as you all know better than I, and traditional forms of church life under immense strain, as we all know in our bones. We know it can't go on like this, and we don't know what that means in practice, and that's a very uncomfortable place to be. But that's where we need to remember what blows from the four winds. That's when we need to remember the will and purpose and strength of God in keeping God's promise to us. That's where the signs of faithfulness to promise become more important than ever. In consecrated lives, yes, but also in the willingness of each one of us as disciples of Jesus Christ to lead lives of promise. In two senses, lives that promise the world that things don't have to be like this. Lives that somehow promise integration, healing, wholeness, continuity. And lives in which we keep our promises, in which we show ourselves faithful to one another. Faithful to the task of building one another up in holiness, in wholeness, and in humanity. No plan for the renewal of religious life, no plan for the renewal of church life, however important those things are, is guaranteed to work. I'm tempted to say, you heard it here first, <laughs> but I have a feeling you've heard it in many places before, including in your own hearts. But does that depress? Does that demoralize or demotivate? God forbid, quite the contrary. Because if the, whole, the wholeness of the life of each one of us, the wholeness of the life of the church, and the wholeness of the life of the human family depended on our success and ingenuity, there would be a lot to worry about. But what if it depends on God? What if it depends upon what blows from the four winds to bring us together, to make us at peace with ourselves and at peace with one another? That's the promise. I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O oh my people. I will put my spirit within you and you shall live. Let us pray. Source of all being, beginning and end, we praise you for those who have served you faithfully. For the sake of Jesus Christ, replenish our hope in your eternal kingdom, that we may have life in all its fullness, unfettered by the fear of death, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably upon thy whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. And by the tranquil operation of thy perpetual providence, carry out the work of our salvation. The things that were cast down may be raised up, and that all things may return into unity through him by whom all things were made even thy Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Loving God, thou dost call thy people to serve thee in building a kingdom of love. 
So we pray that thou wouldst continue to call us to the religious life in thy church, that together those so-called may find strength and joy in following Jesus, the Good Shepherd. And grant that whether they be many or few, they may persevere, persevere in their calling and be daily renewed by the Holy Spirit. To thee be all glory and praise, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Loving God, we give you thanks and praise for the life and reign of Queen Elizabeth II, for her constancy, humility, and service, for her compassion, wisdom, and steadfast faith. Her race now run, May she rest in the peace of Christ, give comfort to her family and friends in this time of grief, grant grace to this and every nation, that we may live together in the hope and peace to which in her life and work she bore witness. In sorrow, in thankfulness, we pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Almighty God, the fountain of all goodness, we humbly beseech thee to bless our most gracious sovereign, King Charles III, and all the royal family. Endue them with thy Holy Spirit, enrich them with thy heavenly grace, prosper them with all happiness, and bring them to thine everlasting kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Be mindful, O Lord, of thy people bowed before thee, and of those who are absent through age, sickness, or infirmity. Care for the infants, guide the young, support the aged, encourage the faint-hearted, collect the scattered, and bring the wandering to thy fold. Travel with the voyagers, defend the widow, shield the orphans, deliver the captives, heal the sick. Succor all who are in tribulation, necessity, or distress. Remember for good all those that love us and those that hate us, and those that have desired us unworthy as we are to pray for them, and those whom we have forgotten. Do thou, O Lord, remember. For thou art the helper of the helpless, the savior of the lost, the refuge of the wanderer, the healer of the sick. Thou who knowest each one's need and hast heard their prayer, grant unto each according to thy merciful loving kindness and thy eternal love. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, who has given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications unto thee, and dost promise that when two or three are gathered together in thy name, thou wilt grant their requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants, as may be most expedient for them, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth and in the world to come life everlasting. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. <laughs>